Last time we looked at the largest candidate rule for line balancing. Now in some cases you may have many tasks, and so if you're on the order of hundreds or thousands of tasks that need to be balanced, the largest candidate rule uh, can be cumbersome. So an extension of that was proposed by Kilbridge and Webster, and essentially what we'll do is partition the precedence diagram by creating a set of columns based upon what that diagram looks like. <clears throat> and also note that the elements, by elements we mean the individual task, are assigned to the columns. They can appear in multiple columns. Of course, they can only be assigned once. And then we sort elements in each column. So from here on out, it looks like the largest candidate rule as we proceed from column to column. So we have to allocate all the elements in a given column before we can move to the next one. So what does that look like? Well, it all depends upon the partitioning that you select with this approach. So as you can see here, I've set up my partitions. And now I'm just going to look at the individual partitions. Now, obviously there are multiple ways to partition this set of tasks, but you do have to take into account the precedence when you do that. So for instance, I could remove uh, this line here and end up with four tasks within that partition. Given that I'm moving from left to right here in terms of assigning tasks, all I have to do is focus on this partition first, and that's straightforward because that's the only task, so we go ahead and we assign that. Oops. And now we look at the next partition, and again, uh, that's the only task there, so we go ahead and assign that. And now in my next partition, I have three, four, and five. Since I have multiple tasks, we have to sort those in order. <clears throat> so when I look at my workstation so far, I had one and two, as in the previous example. And now I have to move on to the next workstation because otherwise we would exceed our service time. Don't forget is 0.2. <clears throat> so I assign 5 here, and then I can, again, pick either 3 or 4. Once I pick that, there's nothing else I can assign there, so I have to move on to the next station. The only one I have left in this partition is 4, and now I can move on to this partition, which again is straightforward. There are no other tasks, so I go ahead and assign that. And then finally, task 7 all by itself, we cannot assign that to this workstation because we would exceed our maximum service time of 0 0.2. So you can see the similarity between this approach and the largest candidate rule. The big difference is we can partition it, and that makes the problem easier to deal with. The last uh, approach that I'll mention, and there are many different approaches that you can take. Many methods have been, uh, have been studied. The rank positional weight takes a different view of the assembly system. And in this approach, what we'll do is we'll look downstream. And by downstream, we mean uh, the task that will follow. And specifically, based upon precedence. So really here we're thinking about the impact of performing a task at a given time. In order to estimate its impact, what we do is we sum all the tasks that follow that task in the precedence diagram. And we call that the rank positional weight. Then we'll take the same approach after we do that as we did with the largest candidate rule. Uh, we'll sort in descending order by the rank positional weight, create your workstations, Again, start at the top of the list, make sure that you don't violate precedence, update your precedent requirements, and then repeat the process until all your tasks are assigned. So with our example, again, the same precedence diagram, now we calculate an additional column, our rank positional weight, as you can see here, which for the first task is essentially equal to our total work content which makes sense because, again, 
uh, we're looking at all the tasks being dependent upon one being completed. Don't forget you add in the task time for the element itself. Then for two, essentially we add in everything except one, as you can see here. And then for three, we're just going to add in three, six, and seven. For four, four, six, and seven. For five, five, six, and seven. And then finally for six, it'll be six and seven. And then for seven, it will just be the task time itself. So that's how we get these numbers. Well, we go through and we assigned, based upon precedence requirement, the first one that we can assign here The first one that we can assign here is 1. So we get rid of that. Again, we go to the, the top. The next one we can assign is 2. And we've reached our limit here. Now we have completed 2. Then we can assign 5. And here, again, we have a tie between 3 and 4. <clears throat> So now we can select four. And then of course, oh, we've already done five. We can assign six. We've reached the limit and now we have to move to the next workstation and assign seven. Well, as you can see, all three methods, largest candidate rule, the Kilbridge Webster approach, as well as rank positional weight, gave us the exact same design for our assembly system. Now, this will not always be the case, especially as you have a larger number of tasks, these methods will diverge. Let's look at an example. We've got a hammer drill here, and we want to come up with a manual assembly flow line to uh, assemble this product. The expected demand from our customer is 60 per hour. So from that 60 per hour, we can determine the maximum service time, uh, which essentially is the inverse of that value. Here's what the uh, breakdown is for the handle of that. And we'll just focus on this portion of the assembly line as our example. You can see we have multiple components and due to the physical uh, limitations of the assembly, we have some components that have to be assembled before others. For instance, we have a set of components internal to the handle that have to go in before this can be assembled to 82 and before we can uh, essentially fasten that part of the handle to the base. So this is what it would look like in terms of precedence. And these are the estimated task times. Again, we would have to know these ahead of time in minutes. And as you can see, in this case, we have a variety of parts that can be assembled first. So as it becomes more complex, it's a good idea to create your precedence diagram from that. Now, our maximum service time at a given workstation is based upon the demand. So we have to be able to satisfy that 60 hammer drills per hour. And therefore, the cycle time or that maximum uh, service time can at most be one. Well, if we add our column here <clears throat> to get the total work content, so I add this up, I get my total work content as 2.8 minutes. My balance efficiency, if I use three workstations and one minute, that means I have a total of three minutes, it comes out pretty high. So it looks like we're going to get a fairly good line balance here, even before we assign our stations. Now, as I said, a good starting point is to create your precedence diagram based upon the uh, geometry of the product. So in this case, this is what it looks like. Now, given the precedence diagram, I can use one of the methods we previously described. In this case, I'll use the rank positional weight. And if you recall, with the rank positional weight, I'm going to take into account, for instance, for 85, all the downstream tasks that need to be performed. And then I can use the assignment approach that we used before. Don't forget our 
service time t sub s is equal to 1, so I can't exceed that value. So here we have the rank positional weight, and you can go through and verify these numbers. And now I'm going to start at the top, and clearly I can assign 85, and that will bring me to 0 0.3. I can have a maximum of one minute at each station. Then I go to the next one in the list, so I've got 85, and clearly I can assign 82. I'm up to 0 0.5, and now I've eliminated these two, so I can assign 86. Now, once I've assigned 86, I'm up to 0 0.9, so the question is, can I find a task that will get me exactly to 1? Well, I have to bypass this one. It's too large. This one, we've gotten rid of the uh, 86 is a precedence requirement, and therefore I can assign 94. Now I'm done because I've reached that maximum time. So here's my first workstation based upon that rank positional weight. And you might try to do this with the largest candidate rule and see if you come up with the same number. Well, then I proceed and go through the other two workstations and and here we end up with our three workstations with the task assigned. And we can see here that our imbalance occurs in the third workstation. Now, if you look at this, again, you have to think about the actual system in operation. This is saying we're at 100% utilization, 100%, and 80% based upon our T sub S. So there is some slack time here. What we didn't take into account, we kind of assumed that all these times are deterministic, but in fact, we do have a uh, characteristic of each task where there is variability, especially if you have manual operators. And so these task times will not be exactly one minute. If you think of these as being normally distributed, going back to a process capability, you can think about the effect of high variation in a given task. So we didn't really comment on the complexity of any of these tasks. If one of them has a high degree of variation, then we would want to be concerned about the potential for exceeding this maximum service time of 1.0. Essentially, you would like the probability of being less than or equal to 1.0 uh, to be 1. And so if there was high variability, you would need to take that into account. So when you're thinking about your assembly system, you need to identify that minimum rational work element. Again, this should be adding value. So you're not considering the handling time, the uh, orientation time, just the total time it takes to assemble that component. That would correspond to the rational work element. Maximum service time, that's tied to the demand rate coming out the end of the assembly line. Balance efficiency tells you something about how utilized individual workstations are, and you want to have a reasonable distribution of the work content. It's not going to be perfect, but it has to be reasonable. The balance that we've created in the examples, as you can tell, is based upon the precedence, and that's tied directly to the geometry of the product, as well as the assembly times of individual tasks. And you're assuming here that the longer the task time, then the more complex it is. The number of assembly workstations will affect the production rate on assembly. As you uh, decrease the number of workstations,